technology is not a utopia. It's not perfect. It's not um, something that is going to solve our problems because most of the problems we have today are caused from the technologies of yesterday. And I think that most of the problems we're going to have in the future are going to come from technologies we have today. So technology produces almost as many new problems as it solves. Making things smarter, smarter than what they have been. And this is what I think is going to be the most profound technological change in the next 20 or 30 years. Our own intelligence is really rather dumb about intelligence in general. We don't have a very good idea of what it is. We tend to think of intelligence as this thing that gets higher and higher, louder and louder, like a single dimension, like IQ. And in the very beginning, we have you know a small amount in a mouse, and then there's more in a rat, and a chimpanzee, an idiot, an average person, a genius. But that's actually completely wrong vision of what AI, I mean, excuse me, what intelligence is. Intelligence is more like artificial, uh, different kinds of smartnesses. And so already, a calculator is smarter than you are in arithmetic. Your GPS on your phone is smarter than you are in spatial navigation. And any search engine is smarter than you are in total recall because a search engine has memorized every single word on 60 billion web pages. Everybody now knows Lonely Planet, but I was one of the first importers of Lonely Planet to the US. They were from Australia. And um, I, that's what I was starting to, to write about. But along the way, I got a computer, an Apple II, to typeset my catalog, my newsletter. And the computer is okay, it was interesting, but when I, I had to, to typeset the information to a local newspaper to have it printed out very nice, and I had to get a modem. Once you connect a computer to the telephone company, to the telephone line, it changes everything. So the computer itself is not that powerful. But when you connect a computer to the phone, when you communicate, that was the revolution. And once I had a modem and a computer, then I saw that the world was going to be vastly different. When we made artificial flying to make airplanes, we studied how birds and bats, insects flew, which was all by flapping wings. And we tried to make flying with flapping, and it didn't work. The method that we came up with was fixed wings with a propeller. That type of flying does not exist in nature. So it was a completely synthetic type of flying. And a lot of the kinds of thinking that we're going to invent with artificial intelligence will be types of thinking that don't exist at all anywhere in the universe, or at least in, on our world right now. They will be artificial types of thinking. We don't want that kind of intelligence that we have. We want them to be different. So that thinking different is one of the aspects of what we're going to get. And thinking different is the engine that's necessary for wealth in this new digital economy. It's actually not that hard to think differently if you're not connected. But if you are connected to all people all the time, thinking different 
becomes very, very difficult and a challenge. And yet that's the engine that makes innovation and creativity and wealth. And so the AIs are actually going to help us think different while we're connected. There was online communities, and I started to write about those online communities as if they were a foreign country. They were like, they were like a country more strange than Japan, more powerful than China. And that's what I began to write, was to really write, was to write about what was happening with this new technology. These many kinds of thinking are going to be the great asset that we are doing. And we want them, these artificial minds, to drive our cars because they don't think like humans. That means they don't drive like humans. They aren't worried about whether they left the stove on, whether they should have maybe majored in finance instead of English. They are just driving in an inhuman way. I didn't really like technology when I was growing up. It was, it, we thought of technology as this kind of um, smokestacks and big computers and automobiles. Uh, I didn't own an automobile. I, I didn't have anything. I, I didn't really like technology. But what I saw when you connected computer to the phones was something very different. The communities and the, and the connection seemed to be very organic, very human scale, very, a different face. It was very powerful. And that's when I began to write about what was happening. Like a farmer somewhere could take something that was done manually, like a water pump, which you had to use natural muscle power to pump, and he says, oh, I have an idea. He was an entrepreneur. He says, I have an idea. We'll take that natural, that pump that required natural energy, and I'll buy, I'll add some electrical energy, and I'll make an electric pump. Okay, that's, I'll save some time. I can do a lot more. I can work 24 hours a day. So that small thing of taking something that required natural power and adding artificial power, multiply that by a million, and that's the Industrial Revolution. We're going to do the same thing again now with this new artificial power. We're going to take that electric pump, and someone will have a brilliant idea, and they're going to add AI, which they can buy anywhere, and they're going to make the smart pump. And we're going to multiply that by a million. And that's going to be basically like a second industrial revolution. So my very first cover story was for a magazine in 1984 called The Network Nation. And it was about this new world that was happening online. And then I just kept writing about what, this, what was happening with technology as it was sort of becoming much more powerful in our lives. So when you drive your car down the road, you, with a simple push of the button or a switch, you summon, you harness the equivalent of 250 horses. That power is now present in your car, and you can use that same 250 horses to throw up a skyscraper, to make chairs, whatever it is. That is the power that we have at our command. But now we're going to take those same 250 horses and we're going to add basically 250 minds. They're not human minds, but they're smart. And we're going to have them drive that car. And that's the auto-driven car. One message that I want to tell people is that they need to embrace all these new technologies that are coming. Even though they may seem a little scary at times, we should use them in order to steer them. If we try to hold them off or stop them or reduce them, it's going to hurt us. We really can't stop them. We have to kind of embrace them and use them and engage them and by engaging them, we can steer them. Individuals can go backwards. You 
have enough money to buy an airplane ticket to go to the Amazon. You could take a bus at the end of the road. You could walk into the woods. And you could leave your clothes behind and live like an Indian. Nobody does that. Everybody can do it. Very few people go backwards. Um, you can unplug all the things in your household. You can get rid of all the electronics in your life. Very few people do that. You can. Some people do. But we don't because it reduces our choices. One of the surprises is going to be how easy it is for us actually to program in emotions to AIs and robots. We think that rec emotions require higher intelligence, but actually, as we know from animals and pets, they have emotions that are not really that smart. And we're going to put the same kind of emotions of pets and things into AIs and robots. And we're going to be surprised by how emotional we'll be and they'll respond to us. Um, and that's going to be good and bad. For instance, one of the things we know about is, is that uh, any screen that you're looking at can look back at you, and um, these screens can actually detect up to 24 different human emotions with very clear exactitude. So it can tell whether you're distracted or, or, or per perplexed or frightened or confused. So, 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 so that it's actually reading our emotions, and it can actually tell very clearly even whether we're trying to fake an emotion or not. That's how, that's how strong it is. It can tell microexpressions and detect authentic emotions. So we will, we will engage with them emotionally. And of course, already we've seen machines, uh, and we feel some emotion to machines even though they're just testing these, we feel as if they're being tortured. Okay, and so it's going to be surprising how emotional we are about them. And there'll be real emotions, even though they're synthetic. There's a whole new scientific journal called Synthetic Emotions, trying to put them into machines. And they will be real, even though they are artificial. Who is the most famous actor in China? I don't know. Is your network on now? Judge up? Because it is. I worked on this film with Steven Spielberg, Minority Report. We tried to imagine the future of com computation in the year 2050. I, I worked with a, a bunch of different people in Silicon Valley, and he contacted one of them and said, can you bring a bunch of people who think about the future? Because um, I want to make a movie about the year 2050. I, I think this was in the 2000s. And so we came together in a hotel over a weekend, and we just were trying to imagine what the year 2050 was. And you know, you can tell from the way I talk, I talk about things in general, but, but Spielberg would say, no, 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 no. I don't want to know that. I want to know what the beds look like. I want to know what they have for breakfast. I want to know um, what the music sounds like. It was very, very, very specific, because I have to film it. So it was, it, was, it, was a very, it was the kind of a challenge to try and imagine the very specific things of what everyday life was like in the year 2050. And we gave him a lot of ideas, and most of them he ignored. But there was a few ideas that we had that got into the movie, and um, uh, I think it was a better movie because, because of that. Everybody who's tried VR, one of the things that they discovered is that it's cool to have a new world, it's great to have artificial objects, but the most attractive thing is to have other people in these virtual worlds, which can be done pretty easily even when they're a cartoon version, and you have just a cartoon version, but if it has the real voice of that person and has all their body movements and their micro expressions and they have eye contact, your, your body is convinced that they're there. So, I think the virtual reality will become the most social of all the social media for this reason. It's the next platform after smartphones. Technology is increasing our humanity. We were becoming better humans because of technology. We were becoming, uh, we are living longer, becoming healthier, we we're becoming smarter, we we're becoming wiser, we're more secure, we're more safe. Uh, there's more rights, we're more knowledgeable. Technology is bringing, making us better humans, not less. When Gary Kasparov beat the world's, I mean, when Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov, the world's best chess player, Kasparov was distraught, he lost, but he said, oh no, wait, 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 
He said, afterwards, he said, that wasn't fair because Deep Blue, the computer, had access to the, a record, a database of every single chess move that had ever been played. And Kasparov said, you know, if I had access to that same database, I would have beat Deep Blue. So he says, I'm going to make a chess league where, where I could play as a human and have access to that database, or I could play with an AI. And so he made a new chess league where you could play either as a human, or you could play as an AI, or you could play as a team of AI and humans. And he called those teams, he called them centaurs, after the mythical half human, half horse. And the centaurs turned out to be very, very powerful. In the last four years, the best chess player on this planet is not an AI. It's not a human. It's a centaur. It's a team of AIs and humans together. And the best uh, medical diagnosis is, is not coming from an AI, and it's not coming from a human doctor. It's coming from a team of doctor plus AI. And this US military has a centaur program where they're trying to make the future of soldiers. And the best a soldier, like a drone operator, is not an AI and it's not a human, it's a team of the centaur plus the AI. And that's where we're going with. We're going to be working with these machines rather than against them. I'm an optimist because of, of evidence, of, of historical, of history, because the evidence is this way. So, so the evidence is very clear, it's the scientific evidence is very, very clear that progress is real. We are living longer, we're less violent, we're safer. This is not uh, an opinion. This is just the scientific evidence. The ultimate way in which we can interact with our devices is to put on VR and look around. And I've been trying that. It's very, very powerful. It works very well. There's two kinds. There are the kind you put the goggles on, and you can, you're in a different world, and you really feel like you're there. And then there's another kind where you wear kind of magic glasses that are clear, clear like this, and you can see a virtual thing in the real world, and you can kind of walk around it and inspect it and move it around. And that's called presence mixed reality. And then the immersion version, it really works. A common thing is to have you walk out on a plank where everything drops away, and almost nobody can do it because your legs are shaking and you're sweating. Because even though your brain knows you're just standing right where you were, your body is telling you something different. Your body feels it. And that's the whole power of this, is that it's working on a different part of your brain than the brain that's seeing a screen. It's a very different experience where you are feeling things. We're going to make it into an internet of experiences. The experiences will be the currency that is being traded. And we have this kind of a, a, a grid of, of, um, of the value. So in the beginning, coffee, for instance, people sold the commodities of just coffee beans. And then they got the idea of, of elevating it by making it the goods where they refine the coffee and they could sell really premium coffee. And then the price went up as, as, as they discovered that they can make it into a service where they just serve coffee. You didn't buy the beans, you buy the service. And then that's the next step after that is to turn into an experience where you go visit the coffee plantation and you have the experience of the story. So, so, there is, so, the, so throughout recent history, there's been a very steady decline in the cost of everything going down, 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 getting cheaper and cheaper. The only thing in real dollars that's increasing in price is the cost of experiences. There were a lot of really fears at the beginning of the industrial age of the same thing, of the jobs being taken. And there was a whole movement of people breaking the machines because they were going to take away jobs. It became very clear that actually more jobs were made by technology and automation than were destroyed. Clearly, there will be some tasks that will never be done by humans again. Maybe like driving cars on trucks or counting money at a, as a cashier. But there are going to be so many more new jobs that are unleashed and invented because of these technology that anybody who wants to work, if they're willing to learn something new, will have a job. So I think in education, I mean, no matter what school you go to, it's not going to be a perfect school. You have to 
whether you homeschool, whether you go to state, state school, public school, whatever it is, private school, um, whatever school you have, you're going to have the parents have to compensate for the differences. And um, I think that the most important skill that as any student can learn and that we should teach in school is the ability to learn how to learn. It doesn't matter what language you learn, it's not going to be useful, it doesn't matter what facts you learn, you can look them up on Google. The real skill, the only skill that's really required is to be able to learn yourself. And more importantly, to understand how you yourself learn, because we all learn a little differently. When the web was first coming, we all thought, oh, this is like, this is like the future of TV. This is like better TV. You could have like 50,000 different channels about all kinds of things. And, um, but we imagined that the channels would be owned by companies, the media companies, just like they had been in the past. You know, there was like the big network, TV networks. So if you watch TV, there was some company making the TV channel. And that's what we kind of imagined. And the big surprise was that no, no all, the, all the video was being made by users, by the, by the audience. And that was something that was very hard to kind of see or believe. Something like the Wiki, Wikipedia. Wikipedia is still shocking and, and amazing to me that you could have an encyclopedia that could be written or edited by anybody and changed to anybody, anybody, anytime, and yet it's still so good and so reliable. That's a complete surprise. We're connecting all of us together. Facebook has two billion social connections. These people, even though they're us, we're sharing only cat videos and gossip, but it's the start of something very, very powerful. Never before in the world have we had a company with two billion customers who are collaborating in real time. So we're sharing, collaborating, cooperating at a planetary scale. That's what is new. We have this opportunity to do something we have never been able to do before. And we're also, by the way, going to take all these AIs and network them together. That's what the cloud was about. And they're going to be networked with seven billion humans. That's the opportunity that we have before us. We have this internet that has quintillion transistors and links and refreshes at a petarate, and it has a memory that far exceeds the complexity of even one human mind. Now, the problem, people say, well, what about the wars in Syria, whatever it is? Well, the thing is, is yes, there's anecdote. That's a, that's a sample of one. But the evidence, the scientific evidence, is actually that we're safer, that there's less violence, that we have less wars. All these things is the evidence. That's why I'm an optimist. It's not, it's not a faith. It's not a belief. Now, the belief is, in, is that it will continue. So, so um, if I say that, that you know, tomorrow is going to be like today, that's a belief. That's a, there's no evidence for that. The only evidence is that for 200 years it has done this. So it's possible that tomorrow will be completely different, but it's also statistically unlikely. The probability is that it will continue. So even in that sense, this is not so much a faith as it is a belief in probability is that after 200 years, it's likely to continue.